when COVID hit at work, it, it felt a little bit like a bomb had hit water. Everything, every way that we worked, every everything that we worked for just kind of like blew out the water and everything was just focused on this um, crisis mode, which is, is what it was and what we needed to do. Um, we joke at work at the time in the first wave, particularly when we kind of things were getting worse and we knew it was coming it almost felt a little bit like we were in the trenches in world war one waiting to go over the top like we knew something big was was hitting but we weren't quite sure what that was going to look like the way we've had to change our approach slightly to um what we send people home with like the way we work really um and some of that has been because the government have changed the um, clinical critical criteria for residing in hospital, um, which has basically been changed if they're fit medically to be discharged, then they need to go, um, which makes the occupational therapy well quite difficult. So we've had to put a lot more um, trust and and pressure really onto our community colleagues. So we may I think I found it quite difficult to be sometimes sending people home, um, knowing that I've referred them onto the correct place, knowing that they've got the best that I can give them, but also knowing that perhaps a couple of years ago, they would have stayed a little bit more time with us to regain some of that function and go home at a better level. For the people that have survived, the hospital stay has been uh, very much longer than would be normal um, within our setting and for older people, because obviously we always would try um, to promote recovery from any illness or trauma happening at home as much as possible, because that's going to be the best place for people to be. Um, but some of the trends that we've seen very common uh, with older people post-COVID or with long COVID is um, things like delirium, which are very, very difficult to manage and plan for. So people really confused, um, very, you know, wandering around the wards, needing that 24 hour one-to-one -one care. Um, it's been quite difficult. Um, and that's something we've seen a lot. And to be honest, I think that's something that hasn't been particularly highlighted in the media. Um, and the sort of presentation generally of COVID. We've seen what has been uh, displayed as well. You know, the people long stay ICU, we get some people who are stepped down from there and just need to learn to walk again. They're learning to eat again after their tracheostomies have come out and uh, learning to manage their new sort of limitations with fatigue and, and shortness of breath. Um, but what's really struck me is, is with older people, um, they've just not fitted the mould of what's, um, what's been presented in the media and what we've expected of long COVID. The impact of not necessarily having COVID, but the pandemic itself and the restriction, seeing the impact that's had on older people, um, so the isolation um, and that social social isolation really, and how that's impacted people physically and cognitively. Um, so we've had a lot of people coming in through to us who have come into hospital through falls or a medical emergency, um, and their function is, is so much worse than it was like last March which can be attributed really to the fact that they haven't been able to do what they normally would do. They haven't been able to be stimulated cognitively. They haven't been able to physically use um, what they're able to do, go out and about and see people and do things. And it's really, really impacted. A lot of older people have been reporting um, to us that they haven't actually been going out and about um, as much as they would have, even though restrictions have loosened um, and that's primarily because of confidence and stress and anxiety around the prospect of going out so where somebody perhaps before this pandemic were getting on a bus walking to the bus stop going to the 
town, getting themselves a few bits. Um, they just don't feel they're able to do that anymore. And some of that is because of that loss of function from inactivity for the last year, really. Um, and so actually where they were doing those things before, suddenly the prospect of having to walk that distance or keep their balance on a bus or keep their distance or wear a mask, um, all those things are causing such stress that actually it's just stopping people doing what what they could do which in turn um, does have an impact on the rest of the way they live their life. Cognitive processes are very much like um, physical processes in that you need them to be practiced and used to keep them going. So if somebody does regular exercise and walks distances, they're more likely to be maintaining that because they're using their muscles. Um, so cognition is the same. If people are using their thinking processes, challenging their the way they think about things, keeping their focus, keeping their concentration, um, social interaction, um, then they're more likely to keep them. And they're just the things that have been lost um, often in through as a result of these social restrictions um, and isolation for older people. I think my concern probably would be around um, the obvious, you know, finances, and it, we've had a massive hit to the finances as, as a country. Um, and although I know the government priority will be there to try and, and address this, is do we have the resources, I guess, is the, the real question. Um, and I think that the emphasis when we do have these cuts always falls back to crisis and acute services which are obviously really really important um, my concern though is actually is the um, funding and the resources going into the preventative measures so actually those things like the voluntary sector the day centers the getting people out and about and um, although they're all preventative measures for actually keeping people's mental health and well-being um, well rather than getting to an acute or a crisis point and then needing that service so I think um, that would be my concern really is actually are we working on that pre-admission, pre-crisis kind of area enough? It's not just about doing something, you know, putting food in our mouth for nutrition or emptying our bladder for that purpose. Like it's about having meaning in life um, and purpose and identity in what we're doing. And I think this gives us an opportunity as a profession to say, yes, times are hard. Yes, we need hospital beds. Yes, we need to be working quicker. We need to be trusting our community colleagues more, but actually we need to hold on um, and really shine for what we can, we can add to this situation. Um, so I think that's what I would take forward. I think as well, it's, it's opened up um, it's opened up a real spotlight on ageism um, and some of those pre-existing attitudes towards older people and the care that they deserve. Um, and so I think it's opened up a real scope for further research um, and promotion of, of care and meaning in older people's lives. Mm -hmm.